Musiris Heritage Project. Uh, it covers an area in Kerala, 150 square kilometers. And it's quite a substantially large project. And this is a project I'm, where I'm working for the last 14 years, 2008 onwards I'm working. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the project, but some of the aspects which will, which will help you or uh, uh, help me in making an argument. I think conservation is the future. And uh, it's very, very important that we invest in conserving our heritage. Uh, when I was asked to do this project the, by the government of Kerala, they said it has to be seen as a global project. And if you say one sentence, they told me it should be a walk through 3,000 years of Kerala's history. And many of you might not have heard the word Musiris. Musiris is the name of the ancient port in Kerala where the Greeks and the Romans and Arabs and Chinese and Jews and Dutch and the British and the Portuguese came during the last 3,000 years. This port was destroyed in a flood, in the flood or tsunami or something in the 14th century. Through this port, three religions came to India. Judaism, Christianity and Islam. That's why Kerala has the oldest mosque in India. It came to Kerala and it came to Kerala through this ancient port has called Musiris. The local name is Pudunallur. The old ancient names is Muchiri Patanam, Muchiri, etc. The Israelis used to call it Shingli. The Arabs used to call it Malabar, that region. That's what happens in this area. It is the first synagogue in India, first mosque in India. The oldest European, oldest surviving European monument is in this area. Padlipuram Fort, which is 1503. There's some of the oldest seminaries and some of the oldest Catholic churches in India is also situated in this 150 square kilometer of the area. And what you see is a map. This is called the Putinga map. It is kept in the Vienna Museum. What time is only a tip of the map. And in the tip of the map, this was a map, 4th century AD map, where the Romans marked all the places where they had been too. And Musiris is marked as on the right hand side bottom of that map. I mean, it's the, the cartography or the map technology, the way they make the maps has not developed like the way we see it now. So it is a very long, I mean, it will be 10 times the size of the what I have shown. And so Musiris is shown according to this map, there is a temple of Augustus in Musiris. Excavations happened in this place from 2006-7 onwards and clear evidences of the trade relationship between the Mediterranean and the Roman Kingdom was established. So the government thought that, Kerala government of Kerala thought that they will conserve the monuments and heritage structures in this part of the area where hardly not even 100 tourists used to go at that point of time. When I was given this project, I tried to see it as an alternative approach to heritage management. And I said that conservation of heritage is the primary objective. And what is going to drive this project is history and conservation, which is very, very, very important. Many of our projects are driven by tourism and uh, other factors, which I think is not good for the thing. We have opened up some museums as part of the project. But setting up museums in Musiris is only a small part of the project. And community is also involved in setting up of these museums. The objects are collected. We are not shifting objects collected elsewhere to these museums. We are collecting objects from the area itself for setting up these museums. The project is six years old. I mean, we started working on the project 14 years ago. It was inaugurated by the then president of India, phase one. 60, I mean, uh, by the then president of India, and eight museums are open to the public. We have an, the agenda of opening up more museums. Work is going on different uh, projects. I'm just showing a glimpse. We have worked on more than 50 monuments or historic buildings which has been conserved. I'm just showing you only very a glimpse of some of the projects. And this is called the Palium Dutch Palace. It's a 16th century building. 
this was the official residence of the Cochin Prime Minister. I am showing before and after images how it used to look like and this is after conserving the building. I mean it was strengthened because it was a residence which was being converted into a museum. I mean you have to, the loading should be, this is again a before and after picture. I mean this was a, a cellar or where they used to store things now. It, the, the shop is going to get housed. It has been converted into a museum. That's why you see the TV screens, etc. The objects were collected. It belongs to a trust, which is more like a family trust. The Cochin uh, uh, Prime Minister's descendants have collected many things for the objects. What you see on the right hand side is an extension where the toilets and ticket counters and some offices connected with the museums are functioning. This is another view of the museum. And this is another building which is a synagogue. When I went and saw the synagogue for the first time, you, I, the photograph I took was what you see on the right hand side. The place where they, I mean this is the entrance building, the place where they used to teach Hebrew has become a residence with a kitchen and toilets and everything added. And there was a ramp for taking a scooter in into that building. And that is something which we have conserved and brought back the building to this level. So it was in a very, very dilapidated state. And that is what you see. What the sea is, on the right hand side you see the building before conservation. On the left hand side you see after conservation. So this, uh, this is a 1860 synagogue. Because there is an evidence that this old synagogue was destroyed by fire and the new synagogue was erected and while we were doing conservation work we found that there are evidences of an old synagogue there as per the historical records. This has been converted into a museum which showcases the history of the Jews and their relationship with the Kerala's uh, community. And when I took this photograph in 2007, I mean, what you see here, it was the bathroom tiles in place of the Haikal. I mean, just like in Christian churches, the altar is there. In Jewish synagogues, they call it the Ark or the Haikal. So what I found in the place of the Haikal or Ark is this bathroom tiles. And as I said earlier, it was, building was used as a residence and being engrossed upon. Or you could find these old chandeliers. By the time the government took over the building, it took about a year for the government to took over the building. And there was a theft which occurred in the building. And all these chandeliers were take, stolen by a thief. I mean, these priceless antique pieces was taken by the thief. And the interesting thing was that the thief did not take the chandeliers as it is. He took the brass out of it. So what he would have got would have been 10,000 rupees when he sold the brass as scrap. And he, he did not, the thief, even the thief did not know the antique value of these churches. When we started doing research on the synagogue, we found an old photograph of the same synagogue, which showed where the bathroom tiles are put. We found this carving, highly decorative ark or the haikal. So we our research went on where the haikal has gone. If it was like that, the research landed up in the Jerusalem Museum. The original haikal which used to stand in the, which used to be there in the Paravu synagogue is now in the, in the Jerusalem Museum. What you can see, this is the haikal which you see, which was originally in that place taken out of India to you, to Israel. Just like how we lost the Kohunu diamond or the peacock throne or many of the treasures of our Chola bronzes or the Amaryavadi Buddhist sculptures. Everything is abroad and this is something which we have lost as part of thing. And this is the original Haikal, old photograph taken as part of the thing. And when we were looking at these uh, research more into this, we found the drawings which they have made when they migrated to Israel, when the Jewish... Now, there are no Jews in the Paravur parish or Paravur synagogue area. No worship is happening. As I said, it was used as... A, the place where they teach Bible was used as a private residence. And looking at those photographs, one of the architects in my office spent more than three months drawing out the details. It prevented... I mean, our budget did not allow us to go to... Israel and study the Haikal. But we thought that it is not 
the Jewish heritage which has been taken out of India, it is Kerala's heritage which is taken out of India, it is India's heritage which is taken out of India. So we looked at the monuments, we looked at the photographs, drafted this, craftsmen started making the carvings, looking at the photographs and looking at the drawings that we have made. And finally we installed these carving in its in the original. Now if you go to the Paravu Synagogue, now it is open to the public as one of the museum. The Pallium Desh Palace has been converted into a museum. The Pallium, this is converted into the museum. One can see the Heikal in its original location with the Theba. The building has been conserved and you can see some panels being put there. And this is the very interesting connecting link between the main building and one of the outside buildings which is there. So we not only looked at the palaces and the synagogues and the temples, we looked at the way people use the ordinary market. This is a market which is more than 200 years old. We documented every building, beautiful old buildings, still rural areas. This was taken by a US architect working with me at that time. She was so fascinated in taking this photograph and showing it to me that chili is stored like that. This is something which has been lost in the US completely. You have trade happening like this, I mean, which is also one of the typical things which happen in our rural areas. We documented every shop, we talked to the every shop owner, we, we documented every building, every house, we, every people who depend on the thing, we made a master plan for it, how the building should be changed or looked at, what are the problems, what is the traffic, how many shops are open every day, how many shops are used as go-downs, which are the buildings which are in sat building condition is good, which are badly deteriorated, partly deteriorated. I mean, this was done as part of the our study in making a master plan for this. So, I mean, we found out which are the shops which are you open close most of the time. We found that about 39% of the shops are closed every day. Some are open only on market days. And we found that people are dumping the waste into the river. There is no proper, there is no toilets in the market where people are, where people could use. And there are traffic jams and although it's a small village, you can see some of the shops have never been opened. Very unplanned development which is happening. So we made a plan for the market. We can have an amphitheater. I mean, it's a beautiful riverfront. We can create a walkway along the riverfront. And we said that I mean, the existing elevation is like this. The shops can be turned into this. And let us make the market into a beautiful historical area. So we did it using Photoshop. What you see on the left is how the building is looking. How the building can look like on the right hand side, we made plans. And we said, let this could be places where people come. And we said, I mean, you can see some changes. You can see the paving happening. You can see some of the elevations. You can see the lamp post. These are old photographs. Now the project is completed. Lamp posts are in place. You can see the stone paving and some of the shapes. I mean, here I try to give the before and after for you to get an idea how the shops can change. And something which looked like on the left, this is how it looks like now. And what you see on the left is one building. The same building is looking like that on the other thing. And the waterfront has been added with places for people to sit. And I mean, now there is a big footfall on this market area or the waterfront and amphitheater has been done. Programs happen in the amphitheater because this conservation is for the people and they have to use these public spaces. These are some of the restaurants. It's very difficult to get a seat in the restaurant during the weekends. I mean, we, we've just made the restaurants overlooking the waterfront. This is another market where we try to do on a similar lines because our development and conservation is development. So that's the way we try to do it. We repaired the buildings and we tried to do the pave, paving. I mean, we did the pavings. We can see the red tiles, how the buildings has to look nice, how the changes. Along the waterfront, again, we made these paving areas. This is another market we try to develop. I mean, now all these shops are occupied by craftsmen and selling their goods. 
as part of it. This chapel which was there, I mean, what you see on the left is very multicolored. It looks like an advertisement of a paying company. So we said, why can't we make it in, uh, overlooking the waterfront? So we said that, why, why can't the color be made light? So we just tried, we was, Kerala is very, very volatile in terms of these things. But to our surprise, the church people came forward and they wanted to demolish the 1980s chapel. And what came in its place, this is a new chapel, what you see, was a replica of the old chapel they had 50 or 60 years ago, overlooking that. So this shows the participation of the people towards these kind of things, very much a part of this. This is the Juma Masjid, the oldest mosque in India. I mean, this is one an old photograph of the mosque and uh, what is happening. So they decided to restore the mosque to its original position. I mean, how it used to look like, the mosque used to look like before we started the restoration work of the mosque. And this, you can see the old photograph. So it came like this in the, when we took over the building, it was some looking something like this, but this was an old photograph of the building. And this is another old photograph of the building. So just see the transformation which has happened. This is a photograph I've taken of the same mosque in 1984 when I visited the mosque as a young uh, designer. And this is the photograph by when we took over the building. All steel trusses, concrete additions, minarets, domes, the original historic core. But touch wood, they kept the original historic core. So that's what we tried to do. So we made a proposal of restoring the mosque, dialogue with the mosque authorities, and this is what has happened as part of it. So we said the mosque has to be rebuilt on this way. The mosque authorities accepted our proposal, and this is what has happened. Over a period, of they demo started demolishing the ugly concrete additions as part of it. And you can see all those minerals and domes have been demolished. And if you go to the place now, this is what you see. The mosque has been restored its original position and this is what you see. This is another photograph of the mosque. Now it has become like a... I mean, there was some opposition in the mosque and in the, the from the same community who opposed restoring the mosque. But now if you go there, everybody is supporting the restoration of the mosque. It has become a big pilgrim place. Nobody knew about this mosque, but it has become a major pilgrim place where people from all over India are coming and visiting. And this is the interiors of the mosque. I mean, the mosque has a lamp, we can see, where which is lit as part of the thing. So we, we deal with, as part of the Musuris Heritage Project, we deal with the history of various types of buildings. As I said, more than 50 monuments have been restored back into it uh, or conserved as part of it. So we're not only dealing with the history of the royals or the rich people or not that of the colonial powers. We want to deal with the history of the ordinary man and their life too. So this is one of the museums we are setting up. This is a photograph taken in 1943 of Kerala. You can see the famine in Kerala which has come. If you see, I never knew, although I grew up in Kerala in in the midst of history and heritage and culture, I never knew such a thing happened in 1943, less than 100 years ago. You see these photographs. It looks like a scene in Nigeria or one of the poorest countries in Africa where people are dying of this thing. It's important that the future generation of Kerala sees these things, knows about these things, studies about these things. It's very, very important. This is a cartoon made by the, uh, I mean, during the famine in 1943. Of course, Bengal famine was also there. The Kerala famine was also there. So this is one of the cartoons made by cartoonist Shankar, where you can see the Travango state. At that time, it was a princely state. Child is telling her mother, why doesn't somebody cry for us also, Amma, Travango, which depicts the situation. Nobody, because Kerala was a princely state, the famine in Kerala was never covered internationally or nationally even. All the effort and everything went to the other distress and this is a cartoon made by cartoonist Shankar in those days. See, we want to look at the Freedom Fighters Museum because so many Freedom Fighters are found. We documented the Freedom Fighters as part of the project. This person whom we interviewed or photographed died within two weeks of it after we photographed him. 
I mean, so many people have lost their lives. It's not India. Freedom was not won to India by only Gandhiji and Sardar Patel or Jawaharlal Nehru. There are so many people who did it. So we looked at the records of the freedom fighter movement. Who are the freedom fighters? Went to their houses and documented. I and mean, these are the records being scanned of the freedom fighters, old records which were taken from collectorate. So this one which talks about Putran and Popan and when he was imprisoned, why he was imprisoned. I had participated in Punaparavaila freedom struggle in 1946 over and I spent more than one year uh, underground. So like that we were just trying to collect the details. What we want to do as part of the project is to produce knowledge. It's very, very important that we produce knowledge as part of the project. We went into a British, old British company now owned by one of the Indian industrial houses. I mean, we found that old records are being dumped like this. Among those records, we found this account book, which has a separate lock. I've never seen an account book like this with a separate lock like this. So all these interesting things are very important. So what Musur is started as a very small project now has become a brand. Now if you go to Musiris, you will find Musiris Bakery, Musiris College, Musiris a center for training and exhibition on natural fiber. Godurid Musiris Heritage Development and Charitable Society. So conservation can lead to development. That is what we wanted to do. Musiris, uh, there is Musiris Residency, there is Musiris Coconut Oil, there is Musiris Auditorium, everything has come. So once when Musiris was a name not very commonly used by people. After Musiris, we started a work in Alapura, Alapi, which is a very tourist place. We did a master plan for Alapi and we worked on Alapi as a thing. So Alapi, when we went there and looked at the canals, there are two, I mean Alapi has two major canals which was there, but it was looking like this. So we, I mean, uh, there were historic buildings on either side of the canals, but historic buildings is not conserved or utilized or any of those things. So without cleaning the canals and where the bad smell is coming out of the canals, how can we have a restoration or conservation of historic buildings? Very dirty. It was a dumping yard as part of this thing. We started as part of the project. I mean, it's not we. I mean, so many departments was part of this effort. The irrigation department started cleaning up the canals and building up the canals as part of it. Started draining out remove the dirt and filth which has accumulated over so many years and if necessary retaining walls were constructed on the sides and water was also slowly cleaned as part of the project which is happening. People have started come fishing back into these, these places. Might be one of the rarest cases where canals in, inside the heart of a town was cleaned up and used. I mean, I put more photographs only to let you know that it's not an isolated incident which has happened. And once I went, people started swimming in these canals, which is also very much a part of the thing. We, because it is important the canals are part of the people, and it's the people who should come up and maintain these places too. You can see the canal site is still not clean. Government has sanctioned another 15 crores to clean up the so, I mean, uh, to uh, make a pedestrian path and a cycling track and uh, walkways and along the side of the canal. And this is a mosque that you see, which has been built on the side of the canal. I mean, this is another kaya factory which has been converted into this. It is becoming a yarn museum as part of the project. This is a, uh, another old kaya factory building which has been conserved. You can see a painting exhibition going on. We are in the process of converting it into a museum on labor movement. I mean, this is another port museum. Old go-downs of the port were conserved and you can see an art installation exhibition going on on these spaces. It's very, very important for us to find alternative uses for these historic buildings. This is again another go-down kind of structure which has been converted into a painting exhibition as part of the Logome Taravada, which was very popular. This is again uh, the one of the Kair factory buildings being converted into a into an art exhibition as part of it. Now what has to look into conservation? The advantage of conservation over the new construction is that conservation is very labor intensive. It uses more labor compared with new construction. 
uh, the advantage is that makes minimum impact on the environment because when he uses more of the building materials for new buildings its impact on the new buildings it is making it's affecting sustainability it is affecting the global warming it's and uh, climate change and reusing an existing building is a very very good way to conserve energy when you reuse a building natural materials are conserved and you are recycling the whole building because one of the most important principles of sustainable architecture is reuse and recycle and the best way instead of reusing and recycling parts of a building the best way to do is to recycle the whole building you are building something which is more in tune with the nature and sustainability rehabilitation of 2 3% of the housing stock mounts perpetual employment in building trades it will remove all kinds of recession or it will be able to fight recession conservation uses less amount of materials reduction of travel is a huge amount of carbon dioxide saving less construction saving huge infrastructure investment is saved huge green field green field land is preserved unfortunately our educational curriculum and everything is focused on construction of new buildings are not in conserving new buildings heritage cons- conservation will Uh, reduces the demand for land and materials and recycles the whole building study done in uk shows that it takes 35 to 50 years for a, even the most energy efficient building to recover the carbon expended in constructed it the most if it is not an energy efficient building it will be much more than 50 years for a building to uh, recover the carbon expended on it and also there are studies done by the us energy information agency which shows very clearly that the buildings built before 1920 are more energy efficient than those put up between 1920 and 2000 and this becomes very very critical in this era of climate change and global warming it's very very important to save energy it's very very important to save the materials it's very very important to make the minimum impact on the environment we have to see heritage as an economic asset and it should be capitalized as part of a development plan heritage is the tool for development but it has to be for its heritage is not a liability an old building is not a liability it has to be seen as a asset and this thing any innovation in green buildings which is not grounded in the hard earned lessons from the past will fail india has a vast heritage that india possesses and it's very very important that we work out a strategy of conserving our historic buildings and even if we use the most advanced greener technology still it makes an impact on the environment what we have to understand the building profession has to understand the greenest building is one which is already existing because it has already made its impact on the environment and conserving our historic cities is smart growth and we can have a smart city only then which is very much a part of the whole thing i will say conservation is the future i'm of the opinion that there will be a moratorium coming on new buildings in 25 to 30 years so it's very important that we conserve our historic buildings use it in a as a developmental project as part of the whole thing what i tried to give was a glimpse of what can happen through our i mean we have done 50% of our project is conservation we are very much involved in conserving our heritage buildings and we think it is our duty and our responsibility to conserve heritage buildings because by that way we will be making least impact on the environment our practice concentrates on these aspects whether we do new buildings whether we do conserving historic buildings it's important that the professional has to take the responsibility to fight the climate change and the global warming and it's around the corner thank you